grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this morning's sermon is based upon the gospel text in which you just heard. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, if you were here last Sunday, you heard a good sermon about a rich man who hosted a great banquet, doing so every day. And yet Lazarus, the beggar in plain view of the rich man's table, was left to starve. Well, today, interestingly enough, we have another rich man. And he's throwing a party of his own, and he is going to heroic lengths to fill his house with as many guests as he can find. He invites everybody that you would expect him to invite at first, but when the time comes and everything is ready, people start sending in their excuses. Sir, they're not coming. What? They had a save the date card. Sir, they're not coming. But they RSVP. Sir, none of them are coming. Now, this parable should sound familiar because Jesus told it twice. My guess is he told it numerous times, but it's recorded for us twice. One telling of this parable is recorded in Luke the other in Matthew, but the two parables, they differ somewhat. Matthew's telling of it is more violent. There's abuse and beatings, even killings involved. It's a parable about judgment. Luke's telling is not that way. Luke's telling comes earlier in the ministry of Jesus. Matthew's telling of it comes later in his ministry, actually during Holy Week. The immediate context is Jesus has been invited to, wait for it, a dinner party thrown by a leading member of the Pharisees. And Jesus accepts. But this man nor his guests are friends of Jesus. Jesus is going into hostile territory. And here Jesus does a number of really bizarre things. First, he heals a man. Now, that's not unusual for Jesus. We know that. The man has a need, and so Jesus is there for him. But it's still the Sabbath. The Sabbath, as you know, expands from sundown to sundown. If Jesus didn't want to cause a scene, he could have easily waited until the Sabbath was over. But he doesn't wait. And as the dinner guests witness this, it dawns on them. It's the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. You can't do this on the Sabbath. Yet before anyone voices a complaint, Jesus asks, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And not waiting for an answer, Jesus then asks this follow-up, which of you, if his son or his ox falls into a pit, will not pull him out on the Sabbath day? I mean, can you imagine a father saying, sorry, son, just hang on. I'll come get you tomorrow. It's ridiculous. And folks, Jesus is just getting started. He then gives a lecture to the guests who are around the table and another lecture to the host who invited everyone to begin with. To the guests, this crowd of snobs, Jesus criticizes them doing so because they were more concerned about vying for the best seats. You see, because where you sat gave your place in the order of honor. Jesus says, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. 
and then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. These people are so full of pride and selfishness, jealous even where other people are seated. And what Jesus is doing is he is showing them that they are sinners in need of a Savior. Then, turning to the host, Jesus essentially asks him, why did you even invite these people? I mean, look at them. They're a bunch of certified, solid brass winners, upper crust, establishment types, certain that they've got it all together. Jesus, as you know later, would call them what? Whitewashed tombs. Jesus tells the host the next time that he throws a party, don't invite these phony, baloney people clawing their way to the top of the social heap. Rather, he says what? Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you. Again, why did you invite them? Oh, because you're just like them looking for payback in this life. Folks, Jesus is firing both barrels at this party. So right after Jesus tells this to the host that he needs to forget all about this tit for tat, whoever scratches my back, I'll scratch yours, and invite the people who can never repay him instead. Since the host likes being repaid so much, Jesus adds, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Well, as all of this is sinking in, as it were, one of the guests raises his glass in a toast and said, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. It's as if he's saying, whatever, Jesus. Criticize us all you want to. We are Israelites. We're the ones who keep God's commandments. Ones who will be eating bread in the kingdom of God. To which everyone says, hear, 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 hear. And they go back, right back to their vapid chatter. So did you see the game the other day? Hey, how's the hummus? I just don't get it. Sure, blessed are those who will eat bread in the kingdom of God, but none of the people sitting around Jesus at the dinner party will be there. They think they're all on the bus bound for the heavenly suburbs because they're Israelites, but that's not the case. So, Jesus tells them this parable. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. Okay, brass tacks, who's the man? It's God, the Father Almighty. Who, or what rather, is the great banquet? It's home. The home that we're all looking for. The eternal home with God. Whom did he invite? The children of Israel. Specifically, the very ones that are sitting at the table with Jesus. Ever since the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God has been telling the people of Israel about the coming of His Son to be their Redeemer, to be their Savior. How did He invite them? Through the words that He spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He invited them through the words of Moses and of David and of all the prophets who all pointed ahead to the Messiah, the Christ who all prophesied of Israel's unworthiness, but of God's rich grace in promising them the Savior. Jesus continues, And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. Who is this servant? Well, it's John the Baptist. It's even Christ himself who said, come for all things are ready. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But all the Pharisees and the priests, they have more important things to do. We gotta go see fields. We gotta go inspect oxen. 
Someone realizes, I need to see my wife. Too busy. Too much to do. Can't come. And it's unbelief that keeps them away. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry. Now there's a hint of that judgment that we see more of when Jesus tells the same parable over in Matthew. He said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. The invitation now goes to the ones who know that they're helpless. To public sinners in Israel, one like Jewish tax collectors, you know, prostitutes, simple folks like fishermen, women, children. And they all accept the invitation. They all gladly show up. And the servant said, Sir, what you've commanded has been done. Still, there's room for more. The master said to the servant, Go to the highways, the hedges, and compel the people to come in that my house may be filled. Who might that be? The Gentiles. Folks, that's you. It's all of you. You have heard the gracious invitation made through the preaching ministry to repent of your sins and to believe in Jesus, to be baptized in His name, to be gathered into His house, the Holy Church, where He feeds you with His word, with His body, and with His blood. You heard that all of your sins have been paid for by the sacrifice that Christ Jesus won for you on the cross. And as a result, God's wrath has been appeased. And then Jesus adds, For I tell you, none of those men who were invited, all those ones who make their excuses and who lived in their disbelief, all of them shall not taste my banquet. None of the people who had a right to be at the party came, and all the people who came had no right whatsoever to be there. So, beloved, I close with this. All are invited to God's great supper to his great banquet. The invitation is extended through the preached word of God and through the life-giving sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And even though the rich man has gone to great lengths to fill his house with guests, what do most people do when they hear the invitation? <sighs> they despise it. That's why it's so easy to get to church on Sunday morning. No traffic. Your neighbors won't be pulling out of the driveway at the same time you do. No big rush to get to church. Because they despise the invitation. And they don't believe it. And they mask their unbelief with these excuses. Jesus himself sat at a table looking eyeball to eyeball with people who heard the invitation. They received it directly from his lips and they still didn't believe. Making excuses as to why they didn't want the supper that he was offering. The problem is never with the invitation. It is always with man's stubborn unbelief. Do people still despise the invitation today? In droves. But beloved, you have not. So, Come to the banquet that is set before you today. Come willingly and gladly receive His risen body and His blood that is hidden 
in bread and wine. Come all of you weary souls to needed rest, to comfort, to pardon, and to peace. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the church.